Okay, well, hopefully we're actually, we've got some pictures now and sound. Um, thank, grateful to people who have actually hung around while we try to sort this out. So we'll, we'll, we'll crack on. We're talking about rigid endoscopes and uh, we'll be, we're recording this, so we'll be sharing it around after anyway. Okay, so um, hopefully you can hear this, uh, as Dan's already highlighted. Really, this is a part of a, a series of webinars that we've, we've been doing for training. Um, and as Dan already highlighted, please do give us your feedback, apart from the, the technical issues. Delete your zero um, te te technical in, ability. In future, we'll have three PCs, two <laughs> backups. Um, I don't know what's happened at all. But um, anyway, so uh, as Dan's highlighted, this is really to look at rigid endoscopy and give you really some background into where rigid endoscopes are used and also on some maintenance and repair issues. So this is what we're going to be talking about, explaining what is endoscopy, giving you some examples of rigid endoscopy, um, and uh, one example of laparoscopic surgery, um, and then really look at the rigid endoscope itself in terms of uh, damage, what, what sort of damage is caused, and um, some maintenance and repair issues. So. Um, have you got any way of monitoring your feedback from them, just in case it does go wrong? Yeah, if, any, if, you, if anything does flag up while we're talking, please fire over a question and we'll, we'll see a raised hand so we can, we can okay. follow through with that. We're, we're going to take some questions at the end um, and oh, oh, yes, you, as, as these come to mind, please send them over or we'll pick up the actual questions. But regarding technical feedback, give us a shout if you're having any issues, but hopefully we should all be okay now. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Okay, so what is endoscopy? Endoscopy is uh, the viewing of, um, uh, microscopy a good example, viewing of small things. Endoscopy is to look inside. Um, and there are basically two types of, of uh, endoscope. There's a flexible endoscope and a rigid endoscope. That's oversimplification, as I'll explain in a, in a minute. And generally, flexible instruments go into God-made uh, holes and rigid instruments go into man-made holes. There are some exceptions of that. Um, but uh, obviously God-made holes are not uh, uniform, they're, they're, there's lots of curves and bends in them and clearly from a patient comfort perspective, putting a flexible endoscope into uh, an opening with lots of bends and curves in it is, a, is a, a lot better from a patient comfort perspective than putting a rigid one in. A good example of that is flexible cystoscope um, uh, versus a rigid cystoscope. A cystoscope is to look inside the bladder look inside the urinary tract um, and uh, speaking as a, a male um, of my age who I think one in three have prostate enlargement so there's a possibility I may have to have a, a cystoscopy I would much prefer to have a flexible instrument uh, than a rigid one rigid are generally done under uh, always up done under uh, general anesthetic so as, I, as a, we're only really going to be talking about rigid instruments in this presentation and um, we're talking about <clears throat> all of all. We only really talk about in, in, in terms of the entire rigid endoscopic instrumentation, endoscopes themselves. There are video systems, uh, there's hand instruments, energy devices such as uh, diathermy and ultrasound, and as many rigid uh, procedures are done uh, under fluid visualization, there's also fluid management systems. But we're only really talking about endoscopes. Yeah. Sorry, Nick, just one yeah. thing I wanted to mention that's come up in the, the past week when we've been talking to different people about scopes is there's there's actually sort of a, a semi-flexible scope as well in yeah. some, in some respects you're going to get through so there that. can be some confusion around whether that's part of the rigid or not. Yeah, which is a very understandable uh, issue um, and I'll explain that in a minute. So um, as, as I've highlighted really historically um, it, was, it was quite simple. Mm -hmm. Um, if you can see my, my cursor here, that this is an example of a flexible instrument, quite an old flexible instrument. It's got an eyepiece on it. This is the control body and insertion tube, and this is what goes into the, the light source. Um, and this is an example of a resectoscope, which is a standard rigid instrument. This is used for, for um, prostate resection in um, the male. Um, and historically, this instrument, the flexible instrument, was using endo units, and the rigid instrument was using theatres or ORs for those of you who are from the UK. Um, and it was really quite black and white, but now it's really quite grey. And as Dan mentioned, you've got some uh, semi-flexible instruments, which we'll talk about in a minute. You've also got 
flexible tip rigid instruments like this, um, which you use for laparoscopic surgery. So it's like a cross between a rigid and a flexible. And the advantage and the reason for that is because the advantage of that is you can move that around to look at the surgical site that you're looking at. Or you can even advance that and look back on the surgical site if you if you wanted to. Uh, another further complication is more and more um, surgery or therapy done through flexible instruments. And this is an example of something that was done some years ago, which was looking at a thing called NOTES, which is natural orifice therapeutic endoscopic surgery. Uh, and this is, was, was reviewing whether or not you can take out um, the gallbladder through the stomach. So you would uh, introduce this, this is the gallbladder here, and you take the gallbladder out through the stomach. Uh, it didn't take off, but there was a lot of interest in it at the time, and there was also gallbladders taken out through other orifices, which I won't go into. Um, how is a rigid, it, but, but really we just, if we just forget about the greyness at the moment and, and talk uh, about a more black and white situation, we're just really talking about rigid endoscopic um, instrumentation, which is a rigid telescope with a series of other uh, parts to it. Um, and what we'll, well, I'll show you a broken down uh, instrument in a minute, but effectively it's, it's made up of an eyepiece, a housing with some ocular uh, aspects to it and lenses, then a shaft which has uh, an optical system in it and also a light system in it. The light system is made up of, of uh, fiber, uh, light guide fiber bundles. Uh, so the fibers take the light to the surgical site that you're looking at and the optical system takes it back. Now the optical system can be one of three main um, things. The standard thing that we're looking at is usually a rod lens or a rod lens hybrid with achromat system. Uh, then, as Dan mentioned, there's a semi-flexible um, uh, instrument which had, uses a image guide fibre bundle, which is a, a coherent bundle where the top left-hand fibre at the proximal end of the, of the instrument is exactly the same as the top left-hand fibre distal end, so you get the image back from the distal tip uh, to the um, proximal end, and the advantage of that is it's more flexible, so you tend to find uh, longer and thinner instruments may use that. And then finally, there is also chip on the tip instruments where you actually have a, a, a CCD chip at the tip of an instrument, then sending back uh, electronically images from the surgical site. Uh, and then there are also additional items. I've used this as an example. This is a, the, the receptoscope I showed you on a previous slide, um, and that is made up of a telescope. A working element here that moves a, uh, a, a you can see just about the tip there, there's a, a, a loop electrode, um, and then you have uh, two chat in this situation an inflow sheath and an outflow sheath that provides the fluid for visualization. So it's a bit of a misnomer scope. When you say an endoscope, some people term it as a telescope, some people term it as the total thing. Um, uh, so it's slightly complicated from that perspective. But to make it more simple, let's look at uh, an inside of a scope. This is a scope, simple scope broken down, and you can see you have the eyepiece, the housing here that houses the ocular system, and then these are the rod lenses that transport the image from the, the distal tip to the, to the eyepiece. The shaft houses those, uh, that lens system, but it also includes light fibers in there. These are, so these uh, light light fiber bundles are in the uh, sheath itself and are fused. So you actually take uh, the light down to the tip um, for obviously the optical system to take the image back to the user. Um, <clears throat> they're usually in a sort of a horseshoe shape uh, at, the, at the end of the instrument. And that, Nick, is, I mean, that's, we have a scope here, um, hasn't got an eyepiece on it, but. The, the challenge we have is obviously a understanding of um, sort of stakeholders in the field, knowing that this is really, really delicate glass. I know you can see in your image the lens system, but you can't quite get across how delicate that is. I mean, some of the really, really fine hysteroscopes, uh, one mil lenses, they're, they're so, so delicate. Uh, we'll go on to a bit more uh, to cover maintenance, but it's um, you know, just fine, really fine pieces of glass that um, that, that make up these devices yeah. and, and, and if they're compromised in any way um, will obviously affect the performance of the device. And I don't know what I'm doing with that. I'm just waving, waving <laughs> it around there. Like a magic wand. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's, that's basically the, a simple look at the inside uh, of scopes. Uh, and 
really what I wanted to also talk about is, is obviously there are you you have seen in your work practices a variety of different um, scopes in terms of the size, the diameter of them, also the the angle of, of um, view, um, and really what I wanted to quickly uh, talk about is the design criteria. Why is that the case? Um, overall size is the first key component in terms of when a, a, an Enscape designer is designing an instrument, what does he or she look at? Usually we're talking about 10 mil, 5 mil, 2 or 3 mil, but when you decide on the area, on the size that you're looking at, obviously the compromise is between is really what you want to do with it. How much is it uh, of the use is going to be diagnostic? How much of it is going to be therapeutic? If it's purely diagnostic, you may even want the entire instrument overall diameter to be devoted to optics, so light and the optical system coming back. You probably would want some way of biopsying, so you'd probably be a little channel for biopsy. And if you're doing therapy at the tip, you may well compromise the overall optics of the instrument for what you're going to put down it um, and fluid because uh, you want fluid visualization. So the, the whole thing is in essence a compromise between um, what you want to do. Um, and you may have channels for fluid, there may be channels for biopsy and therapy. Um, obviously, the bigger those channels are, the smaller the area on that overall diameter is for optics. You need light, because obviously you can't see anything without light. Um, and then also, uh, it's important to have serviceability. Um, the, the better, the, the easier these things are to repair, they will eventually break at some point. The easier and cheaper they are to repair, the better. And then also, uh, cleanability for protein, and ultimately, how much they are. I think most manufacturers of uh, major manufacturers of endoscopes are uh, have got some R&D. Certainly, the company I used to work for have got some amazing R&D that can do some miniaturisation technology that would blow your mind. Um, but the downside of it is it's not cleanable, and it would be therefore single patient use. And if it's single patient use and the cost per procedure is 50, 60k, it's just not going to happen um, in the modern um, environment. Uh, so. <clears throat> That's a bit of background onto the scope. Let's look at um, some examples of oscopies. And the first one I wanted to look at was arthroscopy. Um, what is arthroscopy? Arthro joint associated, and obviously oscopy looking into. Uh, it's a rigid procedure, um, and it's really looking at any joint. The knee is the standard one that I think most people and many of you may have had in the arthroscopy, like that three. Um, but many other joints are now um, looked at minimally invasively. The equipment that you use is a, a four or three millimeter telescope, and I mentioned the um, angle of view. The zero angle of view is literally, literally looking straight ahead. A 30 is a four oblique looking, so sort of looking ahead and down. And a 70 degree is looking sideways. Or, um, so uh, that's you, uh, and that will depend which, which uh, angle of view you want to look at depends on what area of the um, body that you're looking at. Obviously, you need a video system and instrumentation as well, but to give you an example of, uh, that's effectively an outside view of an arthroscopy, an inside, I won't show you anything else. I mean, that's not your name. No, um, <laughs> that's much, much, much more knobbly. Um, that's a, oh, I should mention this is a, a, a three puncture procedure. There are also two puncture procedures. So um, just to get my cursor on the screen. So this is obviously the telescope. Light guide cable bringing the light here, going down the instrument, you see the light coming out of the skin there. And then the other two, this is, a, you can just about see that, so that's an inflow of the fluid, outflow of the fluid here, and then this is a probe, he's just, uh, the, the, I think it's a he, sorry. Um, it may be, <laughs> I'm not being sexist there, am I, Dan? No. Um, uh, and this is talking. Yeah, that's right. And this is an example of uh, an internal view into the knee. Uh, showing the white meniscus. Um, uh, meniscus is, a, is, is like a, a, a shock absorber in the knee, and uh, there's a lateral uh, and a medial meniscus, and um, the outer part of it is, is vascular, and the inner part of it isn't. So there's not, it's not a bloody procedure in general. Um, and then obviously you've got ACL repair, um, which is a, a classic uh, arthroscopic procedure. So. The main thing that really, whilst that, I'm giving you background to procedure there, the main thing to sort of highlight here is, this is obviously done by orthopaedic surgeons, and orthopaedic surgeons and orthopaedic sets 
are generally the opposite of what we're talking about. Dan's already mentioned, got an instrument here. It's it's small, it's fragile, and the vast majority of orthopedic instrumentation is the opposite. It's heavy, and it hits stuff, and quite right. chisels, chisels, chisels hammers, hammers, hammers yeah. mallets, uh, uh, drills, all of that. So that's quite difficult. Certainly, if you if, if you've got a set where um, the uh, I mean the shaver, for example. Um, where you've got uh, um, arthroscopes in a set with something that's quite heavy and not, that you do need to be careful of that because it literally is the opposite end of the spectrum. You've got something that's very delicate um, uh, being used with some things that can be quite rigid and robust. Uh, so that's an example of arthroscopy. The other example I wanted to use was cystoscopy. Um, and uh, cyst is bladder. Um, so it can be, as I mentioned earlier, a rigid or a flexible procedure. Um, it's the endoscopy of the urethra, prost prostate, obviously in the back of uh, and bladder. Uh, there are also, um, uh, this is the lower tract, what's termed a lower tract uh, in terms of urology. There's also upper tract urology using um, usually semi-flexible instruments into the ureter and the kidney. And there are also uh, percutaneous uh, urology in, uh, instrumentation, which is used going through the back into the kidney for a kidney stone in particular. Um, but let's just to talk uh, purely about cystoscopy. Um, there's a cystoscope, there's a video system and instrumentation. Uh, and this is uh, a, a, actually an incorrect uh, uh, anatomical uh, graphic. Uh, there should be a sheath around this telescope, um, like I'd here. Uh, and going in uh, into the urethra, past the prostate and into the bladder. This is a good example of where you would change the telescope uh, for a different uh, orientation and angle of view, um, because this is actually a forward oblique viewing, so if you're looking like that, you might have a, a zero, which is looking straight ahead. And if you wanted to look at the bladder neck here, you would take the telescope out of the sheath and then put a new telescope in the sheath and it would be a 70 or 80 degree, which would look at the bladder neck here. Um, so to go into it a little bit more, the important thing to think about, which is patently obvious, but I haven't made it particularly well, is this is through a God-made hole, and the last example was through either three or two man-made holes. And that leads to a lot of difference in terms of the design, because what, when you're designing a cystoscope, you're thinking about one hole in one dimension really and with obviously arthroscopy you can come in from wherever you like to do whatever you like um so <clears throat> uh just want to sorry, yeah. two seconds i just want to say what i am um, just a question coming up so it might be something technically we can no, i can't hear or see uh, there's a loud bonking noise once in a while uh, unfortunately that's the nature of our business downstairs that's that's people doing some work so I, I better i better not disturb them with that one <laughs> so apologies about that noise and um hopefully that will stop soon so sorry nick please no, carry no, on no um hopefully we, i mean we seem to have definitely got the uh, imps out at the moment yeah okay right. let's crack on uh, sorry, no. yeah. okay so uh, yeah uh, so uh, in terms of basic design you can have a sister scope we're obviously looking at the bladder and, and those areas. Uh, what's known as a urethrotome, which is a cutting of the urethra for um, strictures, and then a receptoscope, which is, is this instrument up here um, for uh, TURP or TURB, which is transurethral section of the prostate or transurethral section of the bladder. Uh, this is some images of transurethral section of TURP, which I'll show you in a minute in a greater degree. Uh, and then the actual scope design, it's again a three or a four millimeter telescope. And um, the image view is usually zero or 12 degree, depending on the manufacturer. Uh, it could be a 30, and a 70 or 80 degree, depending on the manufacturer. I'm sure the manufacturer will give you very eloquent arguments as to why 70 is better than 80 or 30 is better than uh, zero or 12. Um, I won't go into that. Um, but uh, those are the usual instruments you see. Um, Benefit from a, 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 a tray perspective is, is, I mentioned the arthroscopy uh, situation where you've got something like this 
very flexible with something like a drill, particularly if you're drilling for a, an ACL repair, you may have a set of drills in that uh, with being used alongside this, or a shaver being used very, very close to the tip of this, which may damage it. Generally, with this cystoscopy, you have got that problem. Um, so hopefully, you'll see fewer um, damage, fewer repairs as a result of this than you will from arth uh, arthroscopy. Um, those are the images I mentioned. I've just blown up a bit more. So this is the loop uh, of the, the loop electrode, um, and it will resect, come, come back, um, and you'll see here this is now being resected, and so you'll gradually reset a number of uh, other known as chips. They'll be pushed into the bladder um, and then um, sucked out using an eddic evacuator when you've got enough chips in the bladder. And that will then clear the urethra for, and the patient should be able to avoid his um, uh, not being sexist and saying his, <laughs> it's the prostate, uh, be able to avoid his bladder uh, in a better way. Uh, as I said, this is mainly for uh, BPH, which is benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is a very, very common thing. Um, uh, Speaking for older males, one in three get BPH. And everyone, every male gets increased uh, um, increased uh, prostate size as they get older. Um, so that's two examples of oscopies. I also wanted to give an example of laparoscopic surgery, and the principal one is lap coding or laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Um, I want to go into a little bit more background on this, just to give you uh, some. As there's, there's many laparoscopic procedures now, uh, this is was really the one that, that, that changed surgery late 80s, early 90s, um, and um, I'll go into the reasons why and the benefits in a minute, but the patient should present with uh, pain, um, maybe jaundice, nausea, and um, you can diagnose the situation pretty quickly. I mean, there's, there's MRI and there's endoscopic ultrasound, all sorts of clever uh, techniques, but the basic abdominal ultrasound We'll give you pictures like this. This is a normal gallbladder where the fluid, the bile in the, in the um, gallbladder is uh, black and you can see the, the sort of proximal surface of the gallstone reflects all the sound and you then get this acoustic shadow behind the gallstone. So it's actually quite easy to diagnose gallstones with a simple abdominal ultrasound technique. This is the uh, basic anatomy, stomach here, uh, liver, gallbladder, biliary system, and the pancreas would be off here. This is the pancreatic duct, and the uh, CBD, the common bile duct, uh, going in there. They join and then into the duodenum. We call the outpuller of the barter. Um, so, surgery can be open or laparoscopic. The vast majority are now laparoscopic. Uh, many years ago, this was a general thing with, with cholecystectomy. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and now this is the general thing. It's usually a, a four-port procedure. Uh, some surgeons do it through a single port. Um, and this is the uh, more detailed anatomy, gallbladder, um, cystic duct and artery. There isn't actually a cystic vein. The uh, uh, drainage of the, the goes through a sort of a capillary um, uh, thing. So you actually, during surgery, you're only cutting an artery and a duct. Um, and basically, you'll be, uh, I'll go through the surgery in a, in a minute as to simplistically what you're doing. Why is lap uh, better than open? Essentially, pain. I actually recently had a lap hernia. Um, sorry, we had a hernia that was fixed laparoscopically, the <laughs> best way of putting it, uh, and there was no post operative pain at all. Um, there's a shorter hospital stay, they used to be able to sort of stay in the open area five days, which obviously saves cost. Um, and from the patient perspective, as I said, there's the pain, but also the recovery time you can get back to work. And, and most procedures now are done from a day, a day perspective, day stay, in day surgery. In terms of the equipment, think of it very much for the needs of the, the surgeon's eyes and hands. And in terms of the eyes, there are high resolution camera systems nowadays from a wide range of manufacturers. They can be 2D or 3D, and at the very least, high definition, 1080p, or now 4K, 
4K. So it's the same thing as you have with your home TVs. It was high HD and now it's, it's going to 4K. Um, and this is an example of a standard sort of laparoscopic uh, system which is mounted on a trolley. It can also be called a car or a stack, depending on uh, the terminology in the country you're in. Or it can be um, put on the uh, ceiling. Um, so that's a sort of standard situation that if you have it on the ceiling, it looks something like this, where the, the booms have got all the equipment on them. Um, and you've also got uh, monitors on the booms and monitors on the wall, which is a much more ergonomic uh, design. The main advantage of, of, of this sort of thing is obviously if you're in a, a hospital, which is quite a smaller hospital, and you want to have it transported between theatres, between ORs, you can do so with that, which you can't obviously do with that. And then an example of a, a 3D system is here. You can see they don't have to wear glasses for the 3D. Um, uh, which we have 3D evangelists and 2D evangelists, and I won't make comment as to which is better. And then um, there's robots uh, as well, the, uh, robot laparoscopic surgery, where the surgeons obviously uh, are apart from the surgical site here. To very quickly go through the procedure, um, it's uh, you first have to create what's called a pneumoperitoneum, which is Effectively, you either use a needle or a, a, a blunt trocar to uh, uh, get into the peritoneum and you create a, um, a insufflate with CO2, you blow it up, effectively you blow the belly up, so you give yourself room to uh, perform the surgery. You then, to use this diagram here, you retract the liver, um, dissect the gallbladder and the um, cystic duct and artery. You then would clip the cystic duct and artery, you clip, you put two clips on the side that stays in the patient, one clip on the side that comes out, and then cut. Some surgeons would also do a cholangio, an interrupted cholangiogram, I don't think this is that common now, uh, where you'd actually um, introduce a catheter into the, into the CBD, the common bile duct, and uh, introduce contrast, and then look at it from an x-ray, and if there were stones, remove them. I don't believe many surgeons do that uh, currently, but some surgeons do do that advantage obviously if there are any other sort of stones there fixed there and then remove the gallbladder and then close that's an example of a not particularly high resolution image to be fair this is the gallbladder this is the liver and this is at an early stage of the procedure where you're retracting that you would then dissect this area here um, uh, so you can clearly see the artery and the duct and then clip and cut and then remove so that is a very um, simplistic, uh, brief way of, of, of showing one example of laparoscopic surgery. From a telescope perspective, there would normally be a 10mm or a 5mm uh, telescope used in the umbilical port, the belly button port. Um, and obviously 10mm is a, a better image that you get than uh, that you do with a 5mm. But there were some instances of port site herniation where you get a hernia on the bigger scars. And so many people are now using 5 mil rather than 10 mil. I don't know the figures on that. So that's roughly speaking a, 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 an overview of some of the procedures where these, these instruments are used. Uh, do you want to stop for any questions now? Are you I'll okay? have a quick look and see if we have any, any There's um, more bonking noises. Okay. Have, um, which is good. So yeah, we'll carry on. But it's it's great, Nick, to get um, a couple of practical examples of how those different types of scopes are used that you've described, and, and particularly the understanding a bit about the operations and where the instruments then come in as well, because that's I think quite key to the next part that we're going to discuss, which is around the maintenance and, and how some of those issues with it with the the very, very fine and delicate scope to make her. Yeah, absolutely. So as I, as I highlighted earlier, uh, the instruments are small. They, you will get damage. It's just a question of how much and, and how often. Um, but uh, the reason we're obviously talking about first say we actually do have maybe some of the loud noises were coming from downstairs earlier. And there's a repair laboratory downstairs, uh, which we've had for some time here. Um, and during the COVID situation, we were not looking at doing a lot of repairs, not only for instruments, uh, surgical instruments and refurbishment, but for um, endoscopes. And we decided 
during that time to really do some training on a number of things. So please give us feedback if there are other areas that you think we can do training on. We do training on instrumentation as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we do, uh, We have a session that we're going to be running soon again on uh, flexible endoscopy, which had a, a, a great deal of interest uh, last time around. So I'm sure we'll do that again. But we have other sessions on instruments, electrosurgery. Um, so feel free if you want to fire over a question or just some feedback on what, what you'd like to hear. But as Nick uh, so kindly introduces, yes, we have a, an Endoscope um, lab downstairs. Hopefully the loud bonking noise wasn't coming wasn't from, from that, there, destroying, yeah. uh, destroying some of these yeah. delicate scopes. And, and it may have been uh, uh, another uh, another instrument uh, that being, being manufactured. But, um, sorry, let's carry on. Okay, so. Um, I had a, a, a sort of prior to this, I, I sort of thought about um, scopes in general, and it is confusing. Uh, as I said, you've got a confusion with, with the fact that these are, particularly in orthopaedics, tiny, delicate instruments often being used with, with drills and robust instruments. Um, but there are lots of them as well. Um, I, I, and I've divided this into three. The firstly, the, the sort of straightforward, rigid instruments. Laparoscopes, which we've already talked about, that we use in laparosurgery. Our scopes, um, hysteroscopes in gynae with, uh, for the look at the, uh, the womb, the bladder, that's it for the uh, uterus. Um, resectoscopes in, and, and cystoscopes for the bladder, and also for nep nephroscopes, also in urology, but um, through the, the uh, percutaneous route, you'd make a holes so that would be through a man made hole. Um, stuff for the thorax, which is, I mean, there's, there's lots of, of um, uh, vats, for example, laparoscopic vats, um, sorry, uh, video assisted thoracic uh, thoracoscopic surgery. Um, and then there's some weird and wonderful things like for looking at the brain or a fetoscope for actually uh, looking inside the uh, uterus at the fetus. Um, so there's some weird and wonderful scopes. Uh, and they also present slightly differently, don't they, in some respects? Um, I don't know if you're going to show some of that, but some of them tend to have, have are offset or have different sort of yeah. ergonomics to the designs. Presumably, you know, for instance, with a nephroscope, that's directly related to how it's used. Yeah. The reason you'd have that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, but, but probably the, the key factor with all of this is hardly any of these are anywhere near robust. All of them are delicate, mm. and they're you know the, the, the sort of state of the art optics that are in these, and the, the you know the optical lenses that are in these, in order to give state of the art optics, they are expensive, mm. and they are delicate. So um, the idea really is to minimise the cost of the repairs um, that will inevitably happen. Um, Dan mentioned earlier, right at the start of this, semi-rigid, which is a bit of a strange term um, and it's a question of you know what is what is what do you mean by semi-rigid and really the best way of describing it is is instruments where the image is, is brought back to the user via a light a, a, an image guide fiber bundle um, so usually these therefore are very thin um, because you can bend a fiber bundle more than you can bend a very thin instrument and the example there I, I use is the um, upper track scope for the ureter, um, so kidney stones that drop into the ureter and then cause blockage, um, which then forces back into the kidney with a thing called hydronephrosis, and you will then go in with a scope to uh, zap that stone, usually with a, a lithotriptor, might be a laser, and then the, uh, the, the, the stone then doesn't block the um, urine anymore, and you fix the problem. Um, and there are some weird and wonderful PG actioscopes as well. So some of the hysteroscopes scopes we see as semi-flex as well. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. fairly, fairly uh, common. Yeah, thing. yeah. Sorry, I should have mentioned. Um, but again, that's really in terms of flexibility. But also, I mean, there's this flexible hysteroscopes as well. I don't know. I don't at the moment. I'm not close enough to it anymore in terms of knowing what the, uh, the numbers of, of, of procedures are in terms of flexible and rigid. Um, semi-flex but again that's a patient comfort issue yeah you want something that's not you know you want something like that that's very very rigid um, as opposed to something that could bend um, and then finally this i mentioned earlier you could uh, put a chip at the distal end of the instrument so in terms of this you'd have a, instead of a rod lens system taking it back you'd have a chip right at the tip 
advantage of that is obviously you don't have a series of rod lens going back so it's much more bendable because effectively what you've got is um, wires in between the tip and uh, the housing of the instrument uh, disadvantage is uh, whilst it's much more bendable and robust if you do break it and you have to replace the chip it's very expensive um, so another example of, of compromises which there always are in this sort of technology so to summarize we're, we're talking about small diameter rigid instruments which are inherently fragile and therefore can be easily damaged either through the procedure or through normal handling and reprocessing um, and we thought we uh, um, also talk a, a little bit about trying to save um, some some repair money by uh, catching things early so routine inspection um, will definitely help check all the surfaces look through the system check the light quality it's quite easy you simply just put the, the light guide post up to any kind of light source and immediately will see the distal tip that is coming through okay um, use appropriate things through the instruments and do simple things often check it check them out and on simple things like these are taps on the sheath so I can't even find my cursor these are taps on the sheath and make sure that they're lubricated so they, they don't leak and um, so you, you want the fluid in the patient you don't want it over your knees or on the floor of the OR. I think with things things like the um, obviously the light post as well yeah. um, obviously that's very important but <clears throat> extending those, those checks to the actual light cable as well yeah, because quite fine. often you there can be an assumption that there's something wrong with the scope um, I mean there's some really good testers out there for, for light leads um, the design uh, tester is, is really really good I think that's um, and also uh, you can actually test the light all the way through the scope so these um, uh, devices are, get, uh, are becoming more and more innovative to help I think alongside that just really some basic in-house training for your staff and it's something that we um, advocate and our guys do and can come out and show you how quite easily you can um, find out the condition of the scope yourself just visually as Nick, Nick said having a look down the scope uh, even used nowadays using smartphone cameras to have a look and actually you can get a, get a pretty good image of of what the um what the scope looks like itself so so yeah that's it's some, putting some simple checks in place um, yeah. i know you're coming to mention baskets as well yeah we like we like well basket like guide cables i think are, are, just to reiterate that you know essentially you're talking about um a component that is very inexpensive in comparison to the rest of the system. If you're, if you, you know, a video system that I showed you earlier could be fifty thousand pounds, and a light guide cable is what a couple hundred quid. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, if you're using a really bad cable that isn't giving you the quality, then the video system is struggling. It's only as good as the the, the, the that part of the of the the, the overall equation. But that's also, um, I think, the light guide cable and having that education around what size cable to use for what scopes. Yeah, the wrong. Grabbing a five mil cable, and you know, um, you'll see. We've, we've got some pictures of some uh, use of the wrong cable, which is also important. So, um, and in any maintenance repair, whatever whoever you use for repair providers, make sure that you look at the quality, cost, and delivery. Um, and we've got some examples of of some damage. Um, and as I said. You will get damage through normal wear and tear. What you're putting it into, um, you're putting it into an autoclave. There are some instruments that are not autoclave, will probably still, but in general, almost all of them are. And therefore, you're, you've got huge, you've got different materials in the instruments with different coefficients of expansion, and that expansion and, and contraction can cause all sorts of problems between all of those components. Um, putting the instrument into uh, workshops is, what we would call sheaths in this country, um, shafts or sheaths, and, and um, you may get bending, you may get dents. Uh, this uh, discoloration of, of the light guide, which I've got a picture of in a minute, in terms of not using the, the appropriate light guide cable. Um, it could be you've just mechanically damaged it naturally through uh, over, uh, lots of use. You may have damaged it through the procedure. Maybe you've used it with a lithotripter and the lithotripter has got too close to the distal tip and smacked against the distal window. Uh, it could be a shaver that is also used very close to the um, distal tip of the instrument and it's damaged that. I've got an example of that in a minute. And then there could be heat damage, shock damage, perhaps the most um, 
common is, is damage just um, due to uh, human error and dropping. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So examples of uh, some pictures for you. This is due to shaft bending, so you've got cracked edges on the uh, on the um, instru uh, instrument. You've got the distal tip here from diathermy, and the same the distal tip from uh, mechanical damage from a shaver. Um, again, the similar things you'd see also from uh, mechanical damage from a lithotripter, um, and then in inappropriate like eyed cables um, it would give you some damage looking something like this. So those are some examples of some damage. Yeah, I was um, just going to uh, sorry, sorry. To I was just going to go back to to that one really yeah. just to show the shaver damage. I mean that probably is the most single costly repair. Uh, and on a very delicate scope, and, yeah, very delicate. They're all delicate, but um, an arthroscope. If that incurs that damage, then um, you know, it's going to have to have an objective replacement. It's going to have to have a refiber because um, you know, they'll have to make sure that the specifications are correct once the device is repaired. So to do that, you need to have the correct length of fiber in the scope, and and and, and this, everything needs to be. Um, back to the specification so the surgeon when he receives a scope he gets what he expects particularly if it's in sheath so that's one thing really to look out for i think if you're see, looking at an inspecting scopes is just to keep an eye on that and if that is something that you can address with your um theatre team or the or team just to to, to be aware of that uh, yeah. because it happens very very frequently and is always a major repair um, generally yeah I think I think it's important to, to obviously, as we were saying, routine inspection is important, but also um, uh, routine monitoring of any trends. So if you're getting this and you're starting to see this more, is it a particular surgeon? Is it a new surgeon that's, that's just arrived in, in the, the, uh, the team? And you can then, by in integrating with your theatre teams, come back. I mean, obviously, this is damage that's caused in the patient. So it will be the surgeon, and, and that can be sensitive that you then talking to he or she about the fact that you're getting your um, shaver too close to the distal tip. Um, and but equally, to be fair, if you, I mean, you could see I haven't got any video of it here, but if you just go onto YouTube and have a look at a laparoscopic shaver, uh, an arthroscopic shaver, uh, it is used very, very close to the to the tip stand. The standard you were talking about a tight area, um, but just a little bit more care and sensitivity might make a difference and save a lot of money. So, to summarize, um, there's lots of scopes, um, we've already talked about that. I'll go as um, many different types, which makes the thing more confusing. Um, there's lots of different types of damage. Um, to, to those scopes and the stand highlighted some of it can be quite common and very expensive and so what we're really talking about is they are inevitable but if you can decrease them it will have a number of positive consequences both for, for performance and downtime and overall efficiency but overall it also saves money yeah. um, and improvements will therefore prevent problems so do inspect do look do look at the repairs that you're getting, look for any trends and see if there's anything you can do and work with you. Again, your repair provider or your endoscope provider can also help with those sort of things um, and, and have a look at those. I mean, you briefly <laughs> mentioned it on one of the slides, but just the baskets um, alone having, but you, it might be an assumption you've got baskets, but are they appropriate? Because quite often we'll get um, we'll get scopes come in for in repair cages that that look like they're in the correct baskets, but then you open it up and then not the, the actual lids are not fitted correctly. So they're potentially ap applying pressure in the wrong places of the scope, which can obviously dent the, um, the tubing of the scope. Or it could be that, you know, actually the basket that it's in is just far, far is just completely inappropriate and, and it's causing more damage every time that the, the device is then washed, reprocessed, sterilised. So that's something just to review that. Uh, and again, that's, something that um that we, that, uh, that we would do quite regularly by looking at it if it's if the device comes in it's not an appropriate um uh, an appropriate holding device uh, because there are different um uh, different things that the scopes will be reprocessed reprocessed in but 
yeah, you can save a lot of money there, and and it saves uh, sending things off for, for mm. a pair of pleasure yeah. all the time. Just keeping an eye on that. Things might get mixed up, get put in any basket, but yeah, we see a lot of um, incidental damage just just through that alone, um, and having the correct silicone holding in place. So, um, so certainly something to to think of. Yeah, good point. With and also the final point on that is is not only appropriate uh, use during. Um, uh, reprocessing, but also during uh, if you if there is a problem on an instrument and you're sending it back to the repairer, make sure that you don't it, it is packed appropriately mm. because we've seen many times instruments just locked together and you know they're they're truly well and truly to use a technical term knackered mm. and they probably weren't knackered before they were put in all together no. and then just piled into without you know. Well, that's it. It could be a simple, just a simple rod lens damage that one rod lens needs replacing. But if it's thrown, if it's not carefully put in um, and sent off for repair, then you could end up damaging an objective, which could be several hundred pounds worth of damage, or, or yeah, worse still, could be damage. No, that's it. That's it. And, and you know, unfortunately, um, you know, we do we do see that from time to time occur damage as well. So I think it's just an all round education that you know we've had people remark to us before who've come round and. We've we've opened up the scopes and, and, and in the lab and shown them and they've just not really realised what what it, what goes into them and they sort of remarked about them using drumsticks and things like that in there because you know you, you assume that this is a stainless steel device and that it's not got all this glass through it so that you know that's a real consideration you can save thousands and thousands of pounds literally just by um, by that those preventative checks yeah so prevention is absolutely the thing. The last thing, to quote Einstein, intellectual solve problems, geniuses prevent them. So prevention is very much the area, and that's it. Okay, thank, thanks thank very much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick, for uh, coming and presenting, um, the, get, getting the context around the usage, usage of the scope and an understanding of some of the procedures. I think is really key to the to the whole piece of the of the understanding the devices and understanding understanding rigid scopes in general. Um, if there are any questions that anyone has, please uh, feel free to fire them over now. Um, Apologies for the IT problem. Yeah, very sorry for that. I think we'll try and probably run this session again um, in the near future. So if anyone who unfortunately wasn't able to join us, but I think it looks like the, num the original numbers came back on that, um, uh, that were, were on initially. I don't think we seem to be having too many questions coming through. <laughs> Poor presentation or IT problems. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so uh, give a couple of minutes just to see if anything comes through. I just want to see if I can just update and put that back in there. I'm just joining us, mate. See right. Oh, okay. We've still got that. oh yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, questions coming through. See it. Okay. Other question here. Uh, if there is a choice, which is better between autoclave or plasma sterilisation? Um, is that? I can't, that's can't not... comment on that really. You, no. You'd, you'd need to get into. I mean, obviously. If, if we were um, an autoclave supplier, we would say autoclave yeah. and plasma. Um, that's a, I mean, you really need your own. Um, There's certainly some that are more suitable, aren't there? Obviously, certain scopes would only be able to um, have plasma like on the flexible side of things, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's best to go to an independent um, thing to answer that question. I mean, also, I'm just trying to look, it depends on what country. Because you know, different autoclaves are in different sort of settings in different country, different countries. So yeah, you know, yeah. Ev everyone will have their own self-interest. So probably um, follow manufacturers' guidelines on that. Yeah, just to, to sit on the fence. It's a horrible question. I've skirted around massively. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I think you need an independent uh, uh, hospital view on that. Yeah. Okay. So another question here. Um, someone who's not sure how surgeons get used to. Get taught to use scopes. Um, do they have an exam in terms of how they use the scopes? 
Is that something they would do when they're tra training, presumably? I'm sure uh, they wouldn't purposefully have, have da damage incurred on scope. So I guess no, it's, 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 it's a very small it's space. A, it's a good question. The, um, I, my um, stepdaughter is actually becoming a colorectal surgeon at the moment, and she's been trained on the... Uh, there's not a huge amount of care and maintenance on... Um, uh, that, is, that is, I think, part of their training. It's the use of of such and such, but but they can all naturally pick that up um, through good practice in the, in the OR. So, for simple things, for example, um, not just on care and maintenance of the scopes, but for example, you take a hot light guy cable off, you do not leave it on the patient because it can burn. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this this that is part of the overall training, but I don't think there's a formal course. Um, and certainly the company I used to work for did do some camera training for surgeons separately, which was very popular. Um, okay. Thank you, Nick. Um, again, a similar one there, what could be autoclaved and what could not. Again, you'd have to just refer to your manufacturer's yeah. guidelines on the scope there, I think. Um, yeah. Generally, most rigid scopes would go, would go through uh, a, a regular autoclave. Yeah. Um, uh, best way to clean a foggy camera. Oh, sorry, yeah. yeah. Best way to clean a foggy camera. I mean, fog is usually caused by moisture, um, and that will probably be. I mean, this, um, you, obviously, the best. Yeah. Sorry, I'll rewind. If it's if just a foggy image, and you quite often see the surgeon, if in, for example, a laparoscopic uh, procedure, dabbing the tip on momentum um, in the uh, during the procedure to clear the camera then that's implying that you've got a temperature difference at the distal tip. Uh, you can, you can preempt that by using some uh, uh, chemicals, which and you've got sort of, I can't remember the actual... Demist, fog, yeah, fog, fog stop or something. Yeah. 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 So there, there are things that you can do. There are also telescope warmers to, to um, basically ensure that there isn't a differential temperature. If it's actually um, uh, moisture, in between the camera and so if you've got a camera here and there's moisture in between these lenses that will usually be a case of you, you've got some moisture in there you need to um, uh, it's either a case of you might have a loose camera um, so you may just check it and check everything's um, together properly you'll need a very small fit of screwdriver um, to, to just make sure that that's all okay or check the adapters and that they're all um, so there's no moisture in between it. There's a number of different potential surfaces that you can get moisture in between. Okay. Um, and of course it might be potentially moisture in the actual scope itself. Potentially, yeah. and then that you need to... <laughs> Which would obviously be a, be a repair. Yeah. But I think, you know, questions we've seen before commonly is around you know, how, how do they avoid, how do you avoid getting essentially missed, like you get on your, your, your windscreen shield when you when you start up and that warming up the scope. Um, right. but, uh, Questions coming in particular fast here. Oh, wrong uh, does the image quality deteriorate naturally over time, uh, even though the scopes are used to specifications? I, I, as I think Nick's mentioned on one of the slides, the scopes generally, if nothing, if they're staying in perfect condition, they're not damaged, and then naturally in the autoclave, the, exp the expansion um, of the parts. They potentially could naturally pollute themselves over time with dust from the from the from the glass, from the from the lenses, from the expansion and contraction in during that process. So yeah, I suppose over time they would naturally deteriorate slightly. Yeah, no, I wouldn't say hugely though, and, and that would also depend on the quality of the actual original instrument. If, you know, if you're buying a very inexpensive instrument, you'll probably see more deterioration than one of the more expensive instruments. Um, a couple of comments about I think some. Someone's not seen the slides as we've been going through, Sorry. which, which I, yeah, I mean, I think it's been it's been a bit hit and miss today. We've had uh, certainly had the um, IT gremlins in, but we'll we'll share the slides after, and we will be running this again, um, and hopefully we'll have a bit better luck. Uh, so uh, just gonna this is an interesting one. Uh, somebody asking if we're at and stop it training. It's training. Training. No. If not, it was an idea to have a session so we can manage manage scopes. Just a thought as a repair bill is huge. I mean, yeah, this is a session again we can run. Uh, if people are interested, we can run it privately. Um, our team go out and, and, and host this session physically as well around the UK. So 
um, yeah, it can become more practical as well, getting really hands on and looking at the scopes, opening the scopes up. So yeah, and we're convinced that would save a lot of money, just that little bit of education yeah. getting that through gradually. Um, uh, is there any handheld devices? The noise was a big. <laughs> Sorry? The loud noise was a, was a big. Yeah, we're not in a big lab. No. Is it any? Uh, is there a handheld device available to verify the condition of rigid scopes in a work site? Again, I think it's um, it's it's very, very difficult to conclusively determine this. But like I said earlier, you can get. Uh, I don't think we've got one in here. Um, just a basic attachment that you can put on the end of them, and you can put you can use it with a with just a, a cell phone. Um, but yeah. you're, but you speak to the answer to that. Speak to your scope supplier because um, I mean certainly in as you can see I'm not the youngest individual, but in the old days you, uh, scope suppliers gave a little eyepiece that you could just literally knock on and have a look and you could see damaged lenses. Um, I don't know if they still do that. I would imagine as Dan said, there's probably something a bit more sophisticated with a, with a, a phone. Yeah, I mean you can use a phone and but just some basic training which. Just understanding what a broken lens might look like, and if um, if there's burnt fibres, that will tend to give a bit of an orangey tinge, which when you look down the um, uh, when you look down the scope itself. So it's just some sort of common sense knowledge that that you'll know when it when a scope may or may not need need repairing. But it's good to be able to determine between whether something it might be um, burnt you know burnt fibres or damaged fibres or or lenses, because you also might have a bit of an idea of how much that's likely to cost you. Obviously, having a, vis a visual look at the distal end of the scope as well. If there's any obvious damage around um, around the, uh, the the end of the scope, the objective, then then also that's um, obviously quite valuable. I think it'd be worth having an eyepiece anyway. Yeah. Purely because these are obviously quite small. So if you have a little uh, one of those lens eyepieces, you can just look, you know, um, in in a, in a with a more magnified image. So where's it best to test scopes in sterile services or in, in theatres? <laughs> are we going to are we going to put the responsibility on? Yeah. Uh, that's a turf issue. Um, pass. <laughs> I think everyone everyone has a responsibility to be vigilant about these things. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I guess, yeah, I guess both really, um, because also before you go to use a scope, in case something's happened uh, during sterilisation, it, it, I guess you would have to have a look. You would have to have a check. Before you pass it over to the surgeon, but on the other side of things, so really, there's there's quite a, there's a couple of different checking points there. Yeah, I mean, technically, I mean, I mentioned my my stepdaughter is is doing studying to be colorectal surgeon at the moment, and technically, when she uses an instrument, she should check everything, because if it's not fit for purpose, she is liable. Mm. Um, so there should be a series of uh, areas where it should be checked, um, but. Uh, but as I said, I think probably all is probably the best way of answering that, both rather than neither. Yeah, yeah. As I say, it's it's all about trying to do the best for the patient, really, isn't it? Um, there's a few more a questions. We'll sit, we'll certainly share the slides. Uh, thanks for the kind comments as well. Just um, going back to people saying they've been enjoyed the webinar, which is obviously good. That's the intention. And uh, even even though we had the uh, the issues at the start, and um, there was one as a light lead lifespan. Um, what's the light lead? I mean, that's could it could be damaged again. It depends if anyone's dropped it or well, you've also got liquid like our cables and, and uh, fiber optics. So you've got yeah. The, uh, it's a difficult question to answer, and and um, you know, it depends on how it's processed, the, how often it's used. Yeah. Um, obviously, the, the the bigger diameter cables have got more fiber in, yeah. so. They would probably last longer, like the the the, the, um, the five mil cables, four point eight, which you probably use on laparoscopes. So they're they're probably going to be a bit more robust, whereas the smaller diameter ones, um, obviously produce less light, so have, have less fibre in them. So just an awareness of that, really. But you can't really. You can't. I think it's a very sorry to, one, sorry to be uh, not answering the question, but it's it's a bit how long is a piece of string? Because it depends a lot on what it is and how it is. The answer. Is, is check your cables regularly. I mean, if you've got fibre optic, you used to be you could put them up to a white wall and see. Uh, and obviously, if there's any black spots, uh, I remember a problem with a camera system years ago, which was basically a light guard cable where all of the strangely all of the light guard, uh, all of the fibres 
inside the center area, the middle area of the, of the um, light guide was wrong. So it actually gave a sort of a dark spot in the middle of the screen. Right. Um, sure. Very unusual, but you know, so you do check them. Um, and uh, frankly, just have spare ones. Um, it's always worth having spare light guides. But it's also, I think, how they're reprocessed as well. I think some people have baskets with the scope in and then have the cable and um, sort of sensibly and neatly wound is, yeah. around the scopes. Yeah. Uh, of the, obviously, you've got to make sure that there's no overlap, so the scope could be re, um, reprocessed and sterilised correctly. But that's obviously also you don't want to just chuck it in the basket and, because yeah. that's going to mean damage. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, they're very again very fine bits of glass. They start they'll start breaking um, uh, straight off as soon as you the, the, as soon as you start flexing the cable. Um, there's one here. Uh, no mention of oh, the scope. Well, I mean. Unfortunately, we have to stick to operations that Nick's had. So, you know, things like the new and <laughs> hernia and et cetera. Yeah, I mean, they're mainly bronchoscopes are flexible. I mean, there were rigid bronchoscopes, so I'm not sure. So, but, so we, we, we're sticking to rigid from that perspective. But, yeah, I mean, obviously, bronchoscopes are... Um, we, we are doing something on the flexible side, I think. So if you want to join in, into that one, we'll, we'll talk about that a bit more. Um, but, yeah, so... Yeah, I mean... To answer, we have plans for doing the, the flexible stuff, and we'll we'll be doing that in the future. And we'll share uh, we'll share the details as soon as we as soon as we have them. Um, I think we have probably run a bit over now. So um, unless anyone else anything else finally to send across, I think we've answered all your questions. And um, and yeah, as I say, we we'll send out the uh, we'll certainly send out. All of the uh, the slides, and if you could answer, please answer the feedback form. You'll be auto, uh, automatically entered into this draw uh, to win one of the Rick Schultz pa uh, card packs, which are a really really useful uh, resource for learning about instrumentation. And um, yeah, great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for sticking with us through the turbulent technical times. Yes. And um, we look forward to oh, answer to my questions. We're not received. Are there yeah. so single use scopes? Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. So the question is: single use scopes are now being recommended due to problems with with uh, cross infection. Um, that is a, a another um, question that's difficult for, for us to give you a straightforward answer. If you speak to a single patient use um, supplier, they'll tell you everything why you should use a single patient use uh, instrument. The advantages are obviously it's it's sterile and uh, there's no possibility of cross infection. Disadvantages is you'll never get a single patient use a telescope that is as good as this because they're having to make it inexpensive, um, so the performance won't be as good. Um, you've also got the sustainability got the perspective, use, yeah. yeah, sustainability. But, um, but you know, if you speak to a single patient use salesperson i'm sure he or she would say well you know the, the cross infection thing makes it better i don't personally think you know i mean technically if you could make everything single patient use as i was saying very early on uh, in the presentation great um because you'd have the, the very best possible thing but but the, the cost macroeconomic cost for the uh, for healthcare across the world would be just nuts yeah yeah um yeah i had another question just about the cleaning of the devices again and all we could say is just default to your to your manufacturer's instructions on that how it's best to clean and and um and, and sterilize them because they may have uh, particular guidelines i mean generally they're, they're most of these will probably say to autoclave in the um, in the ifu and uh, and and washing them some may require some sort of manual cleaning um, initially before going in a, a washer disinfector. But again, please follow uh, the guidelines from the manufacturer there because that's the most important point because they would have validated instructions. And, 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 and really, if you want the best outcome, unless you're going to perform your own validation, then uh, that, that's what you need to do. So, but thank you for all the questions. Thank you for all the interest. And um, we look forward to presenting uh, another webinar to you in the future. Without thanks, the problems. Without the problems. So thanks, thanks to Nick and thank you. Cheers.